Very good evening to all Mythical Ireland viewers around the world. Well, there's a little bit of excitement this evening because very soon I will be making the draw for the winner of the competition for this book, Celtic Heritage. Uh, you'll have, if you've been following Mythical Ireland on Facebook, you'll realise that uh, uh, within the past fortnight I picked up a copy of this book uh, in a second-hand bookshop <laughs> for one euro. Um, far less than its true worth, I can assure you. Um, I had seen this referenced in uh, Elizabeth Gray's translation of the uh, Second Battle of Moitura from the Irish Text Society and I'd been reading through that trying to re-familiarise myself with certain aspects of that great story and of course to familiarise myself with aspects which were unfamiliar to me. Um, so there's a tremendous, um, as with all these uh, wonderful productions from the Irish Text Society, there's a tremendously detailed introduction uh, and it includes a lot of sort of reference and source material. I am a little bit of a stickler for following uh, references and source material and so in the footnotes and I'm looking for it here yeah in the footnotes on page six of the introduction I saw this reference to uh, Alwyn and Brinley Reese Celtic Heritage page 144 and it kind of just entered my mind that that's something I should keep an eye out for of course I'm always seeing references and sources uh, that I need to keep my eye out for and that I need to add to my ever-expanding library. So I learned something interesting about the Hill of Tara uh, and, you know, the way it was laid out. And there's a suggestion there that there's a cosmology or an astronomy underlying that. So that's something I'll be coming back to uh, most definitely. So uh, later tonight, I'll be making the draw for the winner of this book. I'm going to read a little section of it uh, to you now in a couple of moments. Uh, but before I get to that, uh, a couple of other things. Um, a couple of, well, one recent purchase that I think I mentioned on the page was this, another, uh, another book that I, pick, that I picked up in a, a second-hand bookshop, uh, Celtic Mythology, you know, with a lovely um, hardcover and um, dust jacket on it. It looked like a real high-quality product i think i paid one euro and 50 cent for this i suspect it's worth an awful lot more and browsing through it very quickly i started to see chapter headings that i was sort of familiar with you know the gods arrive the rise of the sun god the gaelic argonauts the conquest of the gods by mortals in particular that was one that was familiar to me and i said i know this i know this i know this it's not an exact copy I think it's a slightly edited copy of Charles Squire's um, uh, Celtic Myths uh, uh, and Legends, which is published under different titles by modern publishers. I think it was originally published in 1912. Uh, funnily enough, they, there, there is not, as far as I can see, any reference in this to uh, when it was originally published. But I tell you what, if you could pick up a copy of this, a lot of people ask me about, you know, where might I start reading about Irish mythology? Um, what would you recommend? Now, some people don't like Squire because his, his language is a little bit antiquated um, and some of it's a little bit romantic. I think he's pretty true to the source material. He's pretty faithful to it. It's a very good introduction, you know. And the only other one that I would recommend if I can go off camera just for a very brief moment I highly recommend uh, the Oxford Dictionary of Celtic Mythology. It's a fabulous introduction. Now it's a, it's a it's an encyclopedia, so it's got entries, you know, from A to Z, you know. Um, so it it's not the sort of thing that you would read from cover to cover. Um, but if you can get yourself a copy of that, new or second hand, that's very valuable. Um, you might have seen uh, in the past uh, week or so. I added to YouTube, um, well, it's really only audio, it's not really a video, but audio of an interview that I carried out with Jack Roberts uh, about five years ago, I think it was five years ago, uh, just after the public, yes, it was, just after the publication of his book, The Sun Circles of Ireland. And so in the meantime, Jack has been uh, prolific, uh, prolifically busy. Um, his latest uh, book is Island of the Sheila the gigs. Now, I intend to get Jack uh, back uh, for an interview. Um, would like to do that on camera if possible. We'll see how that works out. If not, we can just do the usual 
audio interview uh, about, you know, how much work he has done since he came back into the fray because, um, well, he hasn't really been out of the fray. I mean, Jack's been around since his days of researching with Martin Brennan in 1980 and beyond. Um, but, you know, in terms of um, publishing books, his last five years have been quite prolific. Uh, in addition to that, a good friend and a mutual friend of Jack and mine is uh, Judith Nylon. And Judith has just released her second book. So her first book was A Legacy of Wisdom, The Genius, Power and Possibility of Ireland's Indigenous Spiritual Heritage. Her new book is called A Call to Crone, Weaving Wisdom with Threads of Irish Heritage. Now, that's another interview that I'm going to do uh, for Mythical Ireland uh, viewers slash listeners, delete as appropriate uh, in the near future. Before I get back to uh, reading this little section from Celtic Heritage, I should mention that, you know, Mythical Ireland for the best part of 20 years has been uh, a passionate endeavour of mine. It's almost like a calling to you know, my true path in life. It's um, since the earliest days of my life, really, I've been captivated by, you know, astronomy and the stars and what is out there. And I've lived on the doorstep of the great monuments of the Boyne um, all my life. And when I was young, um, you know, the excavations were still taking place there. And so it's difficult, I think, uh, in to be in the position that I'm in and not have uh, a fabulous interest in all this stuff. Of course, when you throw in the mythology, you really have the keys to unlocking the secrets of Brunabonia and, of course, the other megalithic monuments, the myths and the astronomy and the archaeology, where stones, stars and stories come together, as I'm always saying. Anyway, uh, in later years, um, Mythical Ireland has developed into something much bigger than I had ever envisaged it would become. And that's mainly because of the reaction and the response that I've received to the website and the blog and the videos and the photography and, of course, the books. Um, I've had this just tremendously warm uh, response. Uh, and, and as the years go on, it just gets warmer and bigger and uh uh, more appreciative. So I want to say to you that I'm very grateful to you for your continued support of Mythical Ireland. I, I'm just exploring, that's what I'm doing. I'm not pretending that I have answers to ancient mysteries, but I do think that the exploration of those ancient mysteries is tremendously exciting and offers uh, an insight into the human uh, mind and the human spirit. And um, not just the ancient human mind and human spirit, but the, the modern one also. And I think that, you know, we're at a, a moment in the modern world of significant crises, plural. Um, and I think that myth still has a role to play, uh, even though some people would say that's absolute nuts. Um, no, in fact, uh, mythology has always been at the centre of a community or a nation's uh, health, uh, its 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 vitality and its vibrance and its its mental and physical health. Anyway, without delving too deeply into that, I just wanted to briefly mention that if you want to seriously support what I do, and help me in my goal towards making Mythical Ireland, um, you know, a, a full time passion, then you could support me at my Patreon page and Patreon is uh, a website where you can basically pledge a monthly amount towards a creator or an artist or some sort of a person a person with a creative output some sort of a creative person um it's a little bit like the old you know patronage of the arts i mean many artists and writers throughout history have had patrons people who support them uh, financially and in, in other ways um so if you want to offer a, a more um serious or a more, um, uh, let's say, um, practical uh, financial uh, assistance uh, to the Mythical Ireland Project, then please don't hesitate to look at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. I would be absolutely uh, tremendously grateful uh, for anything that you can do in that regard. What will that 
help towards, well, I mean, I want to increase the quality of what I'm doing first and foremost. So you'll have noticed if you've scrolled through the Mythical Ireland channel on YouTube that for years I've been making videos. Some of them are, you know, have, uh, have a, a huge popularity and have been watched, you know, a uh, hundred thousand times and more. Some of them are literally just me sitting in front of a webcam uh, having a chat. The, the audio quality, the image quality isn't that good. Um, and that's because I'm using, uh, I have been historically using mediocre equipment. So I wanted to bring the standard of video and film up to the sort of standard that my books and my photography is at because that I feel in terms of production values is at a much higher level. Look, at the end of the day, this, the most important thing here is the core message of, of it all is the fact that Mythical Ireland represents what I always call new light on the ancient past. I do think it's important to um, spread that message and if I can do that um, in the best way possible then that's what I will endeavour to do. Uh, this is October the 22nd. Within the month I intend to finally have a printed version of my novel The Cry of the Sebuk available for public release. Now uh, that novel was released two years ago on Amazon Kindle and has received a tremendous response. I was trying to raise the finances to self-publish it because the traditional publishing route um, I don't think it best serves authors like me who have a track record with non-fiction and have, who have a following uh, that they can offer work to. Uh, it doesn't make sense for me to spend two or three or five or ten years chasing a publisher um, when I could self-publish. Now I didn't quite meet the target but I'm going to self-finance the rest of it. Uh, but within the month I'm, I'm going to have it published. Again, if you want to support that, uh, there's a GoFundMe page. So if you go to GoFundMe.com and you search for The Cry of the Sebak, and that's S-E-B-A-C, uh, you'll find me fairly quickly. And if you want to pledge a small amount, anybody who pledges 25 uh, euros, I think it's in euros or dollars, I think it's euros, anybody who pledges 25 euros or more will get a free copy of the book signed and delivered to them in the post uh, when it is printed. I'll keep you informed about that. Obviously, I'm very excited about getting uh, the novel to print um, and, you know, uh, very grateful for the lovely warm reviews I've had uh, for the Kindle version so far. Anyway, back to business and I'm going to read a small amount uh, from uh, Reese and Reese's uh, Celtic Heritage. And this is, you know, actually a story contained, it's about uh, Lou coming to Tara and you've probably heard this a few times before. Uh, this is a sort of an interlude in the Battle of Moitura, the second Battle of Moitura, or actually between the battles of Moitura when uh, Nuadu is um, the king at Tara, um, uh, Nuadu Arakdlov, uh, Nuadu of the Silver Arm, and uh, Lou comes to visit. The maimed Nuadu had long since been provided with a silver arm, Aragatlom, uh, and I'll read some of these as they're spelt, some of them are in the early Irish, by Dean Kecht. Hence he was called Nuadu Aragatlom. But later Dean Kecht's son, Miak, healed his arms of flesh and he was reinstated as king of the Tuatadanan. So in the first battle of Moitura, Nuadu had his arm chopped off by Sreng. And because he was blemished, he could no longer hold the kingship and had to um, surrender the throne. In his absence, Bress uh, took the throne. But Bress, it turns out, had Fomorian blood and things turned a little bit difficult, to say the least, under his reign. Another video about that, I think, uh, especially with regard to um, how that myth continues to play out in the modern world is perhaps due at some stage. Uh, soon, hopefully. He was now holding a great feast for them at Tara. When a strange company was seen approaching, headed by a young warrior, fair and shapely, with a king's trappings. He was announced to the doorkeeper as Lug of the Fierce Combats, that's Lou to you and me, son of Cian, son of Dian Kecht, and of Ethnew, daughter of Balor. And as the foster son of Talon, daughter of Magmor, king of Spain, and of Yuki the rough son of Dui. The doorkeeper asked him what art he practised, for no one without an art enters Tara. Question me, he said. I am a right, 
The doorkeeper answered, We need thee not. We have a right already. Lukta, son of Lokad. He said, Question me, doorkeeper. I am a smith. The doorkeeper answered him, We have a smith already. And so the dialogue goes on. Question me. I am a champion. We need thee not. We have a champion already. Ogma, son of Ethliu. Question me. I am a harper. We have a harper already. Abcon, son of Bickelmos, whom the men of the three gods entertained in magic dwellings. And that's a translation of the word she, which you've heard me speaking about on many occasions. Question me. I am a warrior. We need thee not. I am a poet and historian. We need thee not. I am a sorcerer. We have sorcerers already. Our wizards and men of power are many. Question me. I am a leech. We need thee not. We already have Dian Kecht as leech. I am a cup bearer. We already have cup bearers. Question me. I am a good metal worker. We need thee not. We already have a metal worker. Krejna Kurd. He spoke again. Ask the king whether he has one man who possesses all these arts. And if he has, I shall not enter Tara. The doorkeeper announced the arrival of the Samil Donok, the man of each and every art, whereupon the king bade them bring the Fikiel boards. This is an early Irish version of chess. Lug won all the stakes. Let him enter the Garth, for his like has never before come to this fortress. Lug entered and sat in the seat of the sage, for he was a sage in every art, and then Ogma gave his challenge. It would require four score yoke of oxen to move the great flagstone which he hurled through the house so that it lay on the outside of Tara. Lug cast it back to the centre of the palace and made the building whole again. The host demanded that a harp be played for them. Lug played three magic strains which set them first sleeping and then lamenting, and then rejoicing. Nuadu now considered whether Samuel Donok might release them from the bondage of the Fomora, and decided to change seats with him. So Samuel Donok went to the king's seat, and the king rose before him till 13 days had ended. And that is a, a very small portion of Celtic heritage, which one lucky mythical Ireland uh, follower is going to win tonight.